Hey, Coach, um, what was the primary thing on defense you guys focused on the last week where the process of improvement begins with that? Well, you know, one of the things that, that we've worked on consistently throughout, you know, the start of this season is, is our transition defense. That has to be great. You know, we have to have guys sprinting back. You have to have guys talking and communicating. And one of the things that I've said over consistently is, is you sprint back, not with the sense of urgency, but with the sense of emergency. And so our transition defense is something that uh, we've worked on a lot um, this past week and something that we have to get back to and do really well. Um, defending the paint, um, guarding the ball, you know, the, the thing from a defensive standpoint that I got from the couple games that we played in Connecticut was how many points in the paint that we were giving up. And I said before, you know, going into this year, there were two areas that I wanted to, to really be better at. One, guarding the ball. Um, I felt like over the last couple years, we haven't been good just containing and guarding the ball. And number two is being in a position where we can contain the dribble drive and not allow teams to get into the paint, but also be in position where, where, where we can defend the three as well. And so, but um, defending the paint and uh, making it very difficult for, uh, from an offensive standpoint to attack the basket and get points in the paint offensively, that's what we want. And from a defensive standpoint, that's not what, we want our opponents to have. And so those are two things specifically that we've talked about and drilled and practiced. And my hope is, is that we've improved in those two areas. Without having a game to judge that against, do you get the sense that you guys did make progress in those two areas this past week? I do. I do. I, do. I feel like we've made process. I, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like we've gotten better. I feel like, um, um, We've gotten back to our foundation principles on um, talking on defense, being in the right position, um, communicating, um, team defense, all the things that we had talked about in preseason and just for whatever reason up in Connecticut, it, you know, we really struggled with that. And so um, I do feel like that we've improved, but you know, we'll find out you know, tomorrow night and, and on Sunday when we play Georgia Tech. Michael Coe. Hey, Coach. So, uh, like y'all, Michigan has taken a couple of uh, losses early this season. Does it almost feel like coming into this game they're a little bit underrated since they've fallen to number 24 from when they were in the preseason top 10? No, I don't look at that at all. You know, Michigan is an, an outstanding team. They're well coached. I have unbelievable respect for Jawan Howard and his coaching staff and – you know, Michigan is a team that not only has team goals to be able to win the Big Ten and get to a Final Four and win a national championship, they have the coaching staff and the talent to be able to do that. Um, we do as well. We have the same type of team goals as, as Michigan has, and you know, the only difference would be is our goal is to, to win the ACC um, regular season and tournament title, but we also want to get to the Final Four and win a national championship as well. And with the talent that we have out there on the floor, both teams have an opportunity to do that. And so um, tomorrow night will be against a great opponent with, with an unbelievable coaching staff. Thank you. Kira Luck. Hi coach. Um, I know you said that um, during these next eight days or the past eight days that you wanted to get some togetherness with the team. What was something off the court that you were intentional about to build that trust that uh, this team uh, needs to come together with? Well, you know, like during the summer before, you know, classes started, we, you know, we just spent so much time together apart from the, uh, apart from the floor it, it, in you were able to do that because you had that time now that, you know, they're in classes and specifically now they're, you know, ending, you know, the semester getting into finals. There's a number of stuff that's going on that doesn't, you know, we have games, we have practices, we have preparation that doesn't allow us to, to spend that time as a group together. Uh, this past eight days, we were able to do that and just spend time together apart from the court not necessarily talking about basketball, but just spending time together. And I've just really enjoyed that. That's one of the many parts of this job that I love. 
is spending time and developing relationships with our players apart from the court because I've always said that I can't coach you unless I know you and you can't play for me unless you know me. And so these last eight days were a lot of fun and very beneficial uh, to me and to our team. C.L. Brown. Hey, Hubert. Um, I was kind of curious on, um, excuse me, I got something stuck in my throat. I was kind of curious on your history with, with Jawan Howard and um, what, uh, what interactions you guys may have had when, when uh, you had that position with the Mavericks and he was there. I wasn't, uh, I did not uh, coach Jawan Howard when he was at the Mavericks. The only, um, I spent one year with the Mavericks. I was a player development coach after I retired in 2004, but he was not a part of the Dallas Mavericks at that time. The only connection that Jawan Howard and I have in terms of um, us being in the NBA is that we were traded for each other. In uh, 2000, I think it was 2000, I was with the Dallas Mavericks and on the trading deadline, February 22nd, I got traded uh, that day to the Washington Wizards in exchange for Jawan Howard. Now, Jawan went from the Washington Wizards to the Dallas Mavericks. Um, I went to the I went to the Washington Wizards along with Christian Leitner, Courtney Alexander. Um, and so, but that's the only connection that I have with Jawan Howard in terms of the NBA. And um, I was also curious, were you the primary recruiter on Hunter Dickinson? And, and what, what do you see from him that makes him such a, an efficient big man? I was not the uh, primary recruiter of Hunter Dickerson, but I've always been a huge fan of his. Um, you know, he's from DeMatha and, you know, I grew up right outside of the Washington DC area. And so I've, I've seen him play for a number of years. And then he also played on the same AAU team, team takeover in the EYBL with, with Armando. And so, um, he's a guy that, uh, can consistently score down low on the paint. Um, he's a guy that worked extremely hard to get low position down low on the block and he's extremely skilled. He's a fantastic passer. And um, he can shoot the ball from the outside. He's got a, a consistent 15, 17 foot jump shot, and it can also extend beyond three point range. But um, how he competes, how hard he plays is the things that jump out to me. And I've always been a big fan of Hunter Dickerson, uh, even when he was uh, in high school in DeMatha and AAU. And I'm a big fan of watching him at Michigan as well. The uh, NBA trade that Coach Davis referenced, there's a note on it on page two of our notes. It was 2001, and there's a little note on there on, on page two. Uh, Greg Barnes. Hey, Hubert. We, we spoke with Roy Williams for the better part of two decades about the challenge of, of balancing help defense while also defending the three. Uh, from your perspective, kind of what are the maybe one or two or even three keys in trying to balance that, that process? Well, you know, one of the things that we require of our guys is to be able to guard two different types of actions. You know, they're athletic enough, skilled enough to be able to be in position to help, but also be able to close out and contest threes. And that's expected of them. And, and it's expected of them because they're talented enough and knowledgeable enough and smart enough to be able to do that. You know, in terms of, you know, protecting the paint, you want to take away layups and dunks. That's, you know, one of the things that we've talked about in transition and even in a half court, what is our end game? And our end game philosophy is no layups and dunks, you know, no lace up wide open threes and um, don't put them on the free throw line and make them make at least two passes or more so our defense can get set. And so just being in a position where you can guard two actions, that's something that we require of all of our guys because they're they are talented enough in being able to do it. So you can be um, in help position and stop the dribble drive and stop penetrating in the paint, but you can also still be in position to highly contest a three-point shot as well. Thank you. Art Chansky. Uh, hey, Hubert. Um, I was watching a lot of ball over the over the holidays, um, and it's amazing to me how many great players that are out there that you know virtually no one has ever heard of, except the you know the real basketball experts. I was also uh, taken by how tough uh, 
I saw more tough individual players who you know, they all play hard, but some guys are just real tough guys and play, they're playing legally, but they just got great bodies and they just play a very tough brand of basketball. Have you seen that increase uh, in recent years? And if that's the way the game is going, how do you take a team that might not be as tough as you want and make them tougher? I haven't, you know, specifically looked at that and noticed that, you know, in general around, you know, college basketball, but that's something that that resonates with me. That's 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 who I am. I'm all about the big things, winning championships and my hopes and dreams are the same as the hopes and dreams of our players. I want them to have the experience of winning a national championship here and I also want them to have the experience of having long, unbelievable careers in the NBA. But I also find, I think the toughness that you're talking about is, is the people that find great joy in the practice, the preparation, and the process, not just the play. And that's something that that's who I am. And that's something that we talk to our team uh, every day is about finding that joy and the enjoyment and that passion, not just in the play, not just the play in the games, but the preparation and the process and the practice that puts you in a position to play possibly your best in the game. And so I think that's what you're referencing, the toughness that, that, that you have noticed. And that's the type of toughness that, um, that we coach, that we teach, and that we require our players to have on every possession on both ends of the floor. One last follow-up. Is it a, a kid who has an innate toughness uh, and and plays like a warrior all the time. You think that that's more uh, born with, or can that be coached into into kids? That's a great question. Uh, uh, you know, I, so many people ask me, do I think that I would have had the career that I had at Carolina and gone on into the NBA if it wasn't for the death of my mom when I was sixteen? And when, when somebody asked me that question, I, I can't say that I, that I, that I would have, I can't definitively say that. I know that that experience that I had at high school hardened me, it changed me and put me in a position of, of, of toughness and understanding that every day isn't guaranteed. So you don't have the option of taking a playoff. You don't have the option of not playing hard. You don't have the option of not showing up to practice in the game. You don't have the option of not preparing and practicing and as hard as you can because you don't, you're not guaranteed the next day. And so I don't know if it can be taught. I don't know if it can be coached, but I can't definitively say that that experience didn't change me to put me in a position to look at basketball and compete in that way for the rest of my career. Adam Smith, then Pat Welder. Hubert, uh, you were able to get Dontrez and DeMarco in the game the other night against, against Asheville there at the end. And just wondering if, if, you know, maybe just being able to give them, you know, that little taste is something that I don't know if mindful is the right word, but you would like to try to maybe just, keep integrating here and here and there in different places just to be able to get them out there a little bit more. I do. You know, I'm a huge fan and I'm so happy with um, the play and the development of Dontrez and DeMarco. I've said this before, by the time that they leave Carolina, they're going to be one of, you know, the, the best Carolina players in Carolina history. They're going to have unbelievable careers here and they're going to have long NBA careers. I really believe that they're that good. And as good as they are as basketball players, it's even more enjoyable to be around them on a daily basis. And I'm so happy that I get to coach them. I'm so thankful and happy that that they're here at Carolina and I want them out there on the floor. It was great to be able to give them um, some minutes against UNC Asheville. And I'm very excited and hopeful as the season continues to give them even more time because one, they are deserving of it and number two, um, they're good enough um, to be out there on the floor. They can really help us. Patrick Welder. Hubert, um, 
Do you see any added significance to winning this game versus Michigan just to build some early season confidence that this group can be a national title contender like you hope for them? I don't put any extra importance on this game as 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 fun and exciting and as a challenge it is to to compete against Michigan tomorrow night. Um, they were the next team on our schedule. You know, it's about as I said before, I'm I'm about the process, the, you know, the the practice and the preparation. And for us, it's about getting better each day. I don't focus on you know, the end goal, my focus is on every day as a team, can we improve, can we get better? Today at practice, we have an opportunity to get better as a team. Tomorrow night against Michigan, we have an opportunity to get better as a team. And so every day, that's my outlook, and that's the way I look at things. I don't put any importance, more importance on one game, especially on one on, you know, tomorrow night being December 1st, and it's only our seventh game. Got time for a couple more. Davis, Wallace, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Yesterday you mentioned that the team chemistry off the court is 10 out of 10, and, but on the court, like, it's still developing. And at least from the fans' perspective, people have been saying that it seems like there's not a lot of hype after a great play or the bench mob doesn't seem to always hype up players and stuff. Why do you think that is, and has that been addressed? Well, you know, one of the things when I said that it's, you know, is developing is, is at the beginning of the year, everyone's just trying to find out their roles and their rotations. And that, that takes time. You know, one of the things that I love about every player on our team is, is they want to play. I think the real problem is, is if you have a player on your team that doesn't matter if he plays or not, every person on our team has a desire to be out there on the floor, not just for the benefit of themselves, but for the benefit of the team. And as I said before, I can't play all 17 guys and um, some guys will play and some guys will not. And at the beginning of the season, developing roles and rotation, sometimes, um, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it takes a little time to adjust, but I love this team. I love how much we're growing in terms of our chemistry on the floor. And I was really happy with this past eight days that we had just to build our chemistry out there on the floor. And I feel like we're a better team now compared to where we were eight days ago. Got time for one more for Coach Davis, Ross Martin. Hey, Coach Davis, uh, you mentioned on your radio show last night about wanting to get Kerwin Walton more involved. He's kind of one of the one of the players that you want to see more action, more shooting. Why do you think he hasn't been as involved and have as many opportunities to, to score? And what could you expand on kind of ways that you look to get him more shots, more opportunities um, in your offense moving forward? Well, well, I think, you know, I think it's it's a couple of things. It's a two way street. You know, one of the things from an offensive standpoint for Kerwin last year, he he wasn't on anybody's scouting report. And so they were leaving him open. And I really believe that Kerwin is one of the better shooters in the country. It's not even close. And so this year coming in, he he's he's on their scouting report. I mean, he was the only guy that consistently made shots from three point range from our team last year. I think he shot 42% from three point range. So you know, teams aren't leaving him this year. And so one of the things that I told him is that he's going to have to be more aggressive. He's going to have to move more. He's going to have to, um, one of the ways is to set screens. I've always believed the person that, that usually sets a screen, that's the one that usually gets open, but he has to actively work hard to come off screens, to run in transition, to be hard to guard. And then for me, being more intentional in terms of calling specific plays for him. And so that's something that, um, uh, me being a head coach, uh, you know, coaching Kerwin is something that I've that I've learned and grow and, and grown in terms of um, he prefers calling an actual play for him. Um, but also, as I said, it's a two way street. He also has to be aggressive as well. He's been doing a great job of that at practice. And um, as I said before, I think he's one of the better shooters, basketball players in the country. And I'm really looking forward to him uh, being more aggressive out there on the floor and us being able to intentionally uh, set screens, look for them, and get them open because 
um, on both ends of the floor, but specifically offensively, he's somebody that can really help out this team a lot.